Ah, Christmas time. The best time to launch a brand new piece of hardware for parents to shell out ridiculous amounts of money for just to please their kids. But what games would you be opening up alongside your brand new console on Christmas Day, you wonder? Super Mario 64? Wii Sports? Uh, Pilot Wings Resort? Knack? I think it's no secret that whenever a new console launches, the games that tend to follow it usually end up being tech demos that, while showcasing the console's hardware in an impressive way, tend to be forgotten over time. There's the occasional rare exception, of course, but we usually don't get to see the console's true potential until a few years into its life cycle. For Sega, the same could also be said. While it's common knowledge that the Dreamcast had one of the most impressive launch lineups in gaming history, the Saturn didn't have that privilege. I've talked about some of the console's biggest hits in previous videos, but today we're going to focus on one of the Saturn's most memorable launch titles. That game is none other than Clockwork Knight. Clockwork Knight was a launch title released for the Sega Saturn on December 9th, 1994 in Japan, with an international release arriving six months later. The game was a side-scrolling platformer that centered around the adventures of a wind-up toy soldier named Sir Tongara de Pepperocho III, or simply Pepper for short. Now, if you're looking at the title of this video, you're probably thinking, Corn, how could this dumb, stupid, side-scrolling kitty game about a toy soldier be more influential than Knights? Well, in order to answer that question, I have to give more context on the Saturn itself. Early on in the console's development, Sega believed the future of gaming was 2D, and thus designed the Saturn to be a powerhouse for traditional 2D games and sprites. At least, that was the plan originally. What made Sega change their mind? Well. This did. With Sony's reveal of the PlayStation, Sega saw the writing on the wall, and felt that in order to compete with the upcoming consoles of the time, the Saturn would also need the processing power to render 3D graphics. So instead of just redesigning the console from scratch, they simply decided to add a second processor to the console, giving the Saturn a Frankenstein-like architecture that was infamously difficult to develop for. So, where does Clockwork Knight fit into all of this? Well, considering the game was a launch title for the system and began its development in 1993, the developers were tasked with making a game that took advantage of the system's capabilities. Only problem is, all of this was new to the developers at Sega. According to producer Noriyoshi Oba, Clockwork Knight was one of our launch titles for the Sega Saturn, so it took us over a year to create. But when you consider that this was brand new hardware that no one had used, I guess it went pretty fast. It was a big challenge. While we wouldn't see just how much potential the system had until some of the console's future releases, Clockwork Knight is notable for the fact that it uses pre-rendered sprites in 3D environments for much of its assets. Even though the game plays on a 2D plane, you're constantly traveling between the foreground, the background, and interacting with solid objects rendered in 3D. We wouldn't see something like this until the release of Donkey Kong Country, but in my opinion, I believe what the team behind Clockwork Knight was able to create is nothing short of amazing, and its technical achievements shouldn't be overlooked. But what exactly did the developers create? Well, let's jump right into Clockwork Knight and find out. So the story of Clockwork Knight is as follows. At the stroke of midnight, a beautiful princess named Chelsea appears from a small clock to sing a song that brings the inanimate toys of Toyland to life. Well, singing is kind of subjective, because it basically just amounts to this. Wake up, dear friend, it's midnight. Come on, Chelsea, put some backbone into it. If I was trying to sing people awake, I think it'd go something like this. Wake up, wake up, run, 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 put a little make up. Anyways, we're briefly introduced to the many denizens of Toyland before we properly meet our main hero. Pepperocho, a clumsy but good-hearted toy soldier, is madly in love with a princess, but often faces competition for her heart from his rival Ginger, another toy soldier. Their friendly spat over the princess is suddenly put on hold when a mysterious force kidnaps her and causes some of the toys to turn hostile. Hopping aboard his steed Bado Bado, Pepperocho sets off on an adventure through the house to rescue Chelsea. From the premise alone, you probably might be thinking of a certain animated feature also centering on toys, but as I mentioned earlier, Clockwork Knight predates that movie by a couple years. I mean, sure, the concept of toys coming to life isn't anything new, but Clockwork Knight manages to forge its own identity in ways that are a lot more subtle. As you take control of Pepper, you begin your adventure in earnest by traveling through the rooms of two children, before making your way to the kitchen and eventually the attic. 
Clockwork Knight uses everyday household objects for both its stage design as well as its enemy design. One minute you'll be hopping on board a train, taking down toy helicopters, and the next you'll be jumping across dirty dishes and sponges to avoid drowning in the kitchen sink. Clockwork Knight does a great job at making you feel like you're embarking on a large-scale adventure, and in traditional Sega fashion, all the enemies have really cool and weird designs. Living bags of Darjeeling tea, toy robots, all sorts of little knickknacks that want to put a stop to Pepper's quest. Luckily, the toy soldier isn't going into this empty-handed. Pepper Ocho wouldn't be a knight without his trusty Keyblade. Yeah, a Keyblade. There's an obvious joke to be made here, but I'll spare you from the blatant comparison. Using his Keyblade, Pepper Rocho can fend off against the many threats that stand between him and Chelsea. This even includes using his key to open new pathways to alternate exits and secret rooms. But that's not Pepper's only use of his blade either. Certain enemies have a stun mechanic where if you attack them, stars will start circling above their head. If you keep attacking, the number of stars will increase and eventually the enemy will die. But if you hold down the attack button, you can pick the enemy up and throw them at other obstacles. Sometimes this has the effect of throwing a Koopa shell in Super Mario Bros., and you'll gain a ton of points, and possibly even a life if you're good enough. Learning how to master the throw mechanic is essential if you want to beat the latter half of Clockwork Knight, as certain enemies and bosses can only be defeated if you know how to use it well. Like a lot of games of this generation, tutorials were basically non-existent, so in order to know what the character was capable of, you'd have to read through the manual, which is next to impossible to do nowadays with most physical copies of Saturn games unless you go on the internet. But in the case of Clockwork Knight, I think the gameplay is simple enough that you'd be able to get by with simple experimentation. But if you're unsure about your gaming skills, I suggest going into the options menu on your first playthrough, setting your lives to max, and adjusting the difficulty to training mode. Here, you'll gain a better understanding of the game's level design and boss patterns, but at a stupidly ridiculous cost. You can almost make it to the final boss of the game before you get a message saying that you need to beat the game on normal mode in order to finish it. Panzer Dragoon had a similar issue where the first four chapters of the game could be played on easy mode, but in order to see the last three stages, you'd need to bump the difficulty up. At least in that game, you still had a sizable chunk that you hadn't seen yet, so going back on normal wasn't that big of a deal. But the fact that Clockwork Knight allows you to nearly finish the game before locking you out of a final battle is just ridiculous. Panzer Dragoon 2 and Knights solved these problems, so thankfully, later Saturn games of this caliber didn't follow in this direction. But roadblocking lesser skilled players from finishing the game for the sake of adding replayability is just not a good compromise. Most Saturn games can be finished in less than an hour if you're good enough. And while Clockwork Knight isn't as difficult as some of the other games I've mentioned, I still think it was a dumb decision. <laughs> But if the thought of bumping the difficulty up scares you, there's a ton of ways to earn lives and extra health as you explore each level. Pepper starts with three hits by default, and by collecting these bronze or silver cogs, you can restore some of your hits. But the ones you want to go for are the golden cogs. These grant Pepper Rocho an extra hit, allowing you to stay in the game longer. As you reach the gold mark towards the end of a stage, you'll be given a chance to receive a 1-up by performing a long jump and landing on a missing letter to complete the words listed above. This can be a bit of a crapshoot, however, as it requires you to master this game's controls, which, while not terrible or anything, do require some practice to get the hang of. The best way I can honestly describe how it feels to control Pepperocho is that by default, he has a slow walking speed that doesn't really get him anywhere. But by double tapping on the D-pad in the direction you want to go, like Kirby Superstar for example, he'll start running. This is where things get a little more difficult. There's a lot of friction underneath Pepper's feet, and 90% of the time, it feels like you're sliding across the floor. So when you combine your running speed and having to make precise jumps on some of the later levels of the game, this is where it becomes a little frustrating. When the level design is more broad and doesn't require a lot from the player, the controls are serviceable and are absolutely fine. It's when you start throwing more narrow platforms that I think the controls are a disservice. But that's only near the end of the game. I think the rest of the time, the game plays well enough that I can adjust. I even managed to complete the stage goal minigame a couple times. Aside from that, as you travel through each stage, you'll also collect some white bottle cap looking coins. These are used to play Soltillo's roulette after you beat a boss. Who's Soltia, you ask? She's a perfume bottle who has a thing for Pepperocho, and... Uh, oh. Okay, game. 
just go ahead and just make an inanimate object sexy. Why don't you see if I care? I don't care. I absolutely do not care. I absolutely positively do not care in the slight. I care immensely. Anyways, if you have enough coins to bet, you'll be given a chance to earn some lives. But if I'm being honest, this is easier said than done. The speed at which the boxes rotate is just way too fast for the human eye to comprehend, and it all boils down to luck. However, the more coins you give Soltia, the less chances you'll accidentally pick a dud. However, I would recommend saving your coins for later, because if you manage to get a game over, you can spend a few coins to continue from where you left off. If you're good enough at the game, racking up lives and coins will come as second nature. So, most of the time I find myself skipping out on Soltia's roulette, as it's just left too much up to chance to be a viable option. Sorry, Soltia. You mean well, but I just don't think your minigame is too helpful. Quality of life issues aside though, I still think Clockwork Knight is a fun game. The open-ended level design reminds me a lot of the classic Sonic games, and discovering shortcuts and new paths to take definitely gives the game more longevity upon repeat playthroughs. But the highlight of the game is the boss fights. Each one of these feels unique in their own way, and features some of the weirdest designs for bosses I've ever seen in a Sega game. Considering you're a toy soldier, it's natural that you'll eventually come face to face with a blue-headed ventriloquist dummy or a literal transforming robot. But what about a penguin chef that you smack right up the butt with your sword, or this terrifying abomination? Jesus, is that a television or is that Freddy Krueger from Nightmare on Elm Street 3? Upon defeating the boss of World 4 and rescuing Chelsea, you're confronted with this smiling television monster that you have to defeat using a jar of sharpened pencils. After getting a few hits in, you'll have successfully completed the game only to find that Chelsea is under a spell of some sort and… wait, that's it? That's the end of the game? Yeah, you beat the final boss and rescue Chelsea only to end on a cliffhanger and Sultia is singing this rather fantastic jazzy tune as the credits roll. But it just kinda leaves you feeling empty, doesn't it? Well, thankfully, it wouldn't be long for this little cliffhanger to be resolved, as the very next year, Clockwork Night 2 was released, and immediately picked up the story from where the first game left off. So, since it's the holidays, we're gonna look at two games for the price of one. Pepperocho has his work cut out for him, because he gets not more than a couple of seconds to recover before Chelsea is snatched away again. So, it's off on another adventure as we traverse more of the house in search of the princess. This time, we get the chance to explore the playroom, the study, the bathroom, and finally, a clock tower. Which confuses me, to be honest. I thought it might be the inside of a grandfather clock, but the size of the area you're traveling through suggests that you're inside of a clock tower built into the house, which makes no sense, but you do you, Clockwork Knight. As far as gameplay goes, Clockwork Knight 2 is nearly identical to the original game in almost every single way, but with some minor changes. One major improvement from the first game is that you no longer have to hold down the attack button to pick up an object. That's been given its own button, and since you can map it to anything, this makes combat much better. But that's not the only change. Hidden throughout each level are four cards. If you manage to find all 32, you'll be given a secret code that unlocks a level select option. Saturn games like this had a ton of cool cheat codes, including a code to max out your lives to 999, and even an option to play as Pepper's rival Ginger. However, I'm not nearly skilled enough at these games to accomplish something like that, so it's thanks to sites like GameFAQs and Sega Retro that I'm able to experiment with these options to begin with. Which I definitely needed to do, as my first time playing Clockwork Night 2, I had an absolutely miserable experience. Because of the first game locking you out of the final boss encounter, I figured the same would be true for the sequel. So rather than starting on the easiest difficulty, I began on normal, with the max lives code inputted to give myself some elbow room. World 1 went by with no problems whatsoever, and I was thoroughly enjoying the more fast-paced level design. I made the Donkey Kong Country comparison earlier, but throughout the game are levels where you hop aboard your trusty steed similar to the minecart levels in DKC. These are actually a lot of fun, and I really enjoy them as a whole. It wasn't until I got to the end of World 2 where my problems truly began. After making it through both levels of the study room, you'll face off against a living piece of paper that uses a bottle of ink to transform into a variety of animals. This boss. This. Fucking. Boss. This boss was one of the biggest difficulty spikes I've ever encountered in a video game and it all boils down to one major problem, the camera. 
Whenever you're a certain distance away from the boss, the camera tends to snap towards Pepperocho, rather than pulling out to give you a better view of your surroundings. As a result, whenever the boss would enter its second phase and transform into a cheetah, it would go off screen and I'd end up taking hits I couldn't react to in time because of how fast it'd come towards me. I lost roughly 40 lives trying to beat this thing, and after all that was said and done, I had to shut the game off to recover. I had mixed feelings about my first time playing Clockwork Knight 2, and I was dreading having to pick it up again just to see it through to the end. But to my surprise, once I started fresh, I got through World 2 on my first try and started having a really good time. In fact, I'd argue that Clockwork Knight 2 is even better than the first game. The level design is better, there's tons of secrets to discover, and the bosses, including that one, are just as varied and fun as before. I especially love the last two bosses of the game. You start out in what appears to be a mini gauntlet against some mooks before being catapulted to the top of the clock tower to square off with this robot golem, before coming face to face with the culprit of Chelsea's kidnapping, the Clockwork Dragon. It's only fitting that a knight in shining armor saves the damsel in distress from a fire-breathing dragon. But after all that's said and done, Chelsea's still under the sleeping spell. But not for much longer. Turns out the person who kidnapped Chelsea was Pepperocho's grandfather, Galoosh. He claims that he was under the influence of the evil force, and that in order to awaken Chelsea, Ginger's key is needed as she is his sister. Wait, Ginger didn't know that he was related to Chelsea? In fact, he's just as surprised as I am. Like, game, you can't just drop this info on us at the last second. What am I supposed to do with this new information? Now I know how Han fell at the end of Return of the Jedi. He's my brother. God, that face gets me every time. It's hilarious. So with Chelsea rescued, the toys all celebrate their victory as the princess is safely returned to Toyland. As for the evil force, that's never explained. But at least we get a cool roundup of all the characters we've met over the course of both games. Though some of these character descriptions confuse me if I'm being honest. Soltia is described as being a selfish and headstrong woman. Headstrong, I could believe, but selfish? She spent her time in the game giving us lives and extra coins so we could find Chelsea. What, is she selfish because Pepper may or may not reciprocate her feelings? It's okay, Soltia. I still love you. Also, the game describes Ginger as cool and nihilistic? I don't know if that's a translation error, but I definitely don't think nihilistic is the word I'd use to describe him. I just learned that the girl I was in love with was my sister. Life is meaningless. Life is pain. And that's Clockwork Knight, a fun little adventure that, while not revolutionary by any means, still manages to be a good time. But something about these two games feels... off. I feel like you can't really play either of them on their own without the other, and there's a very logical answer to that. I read about this on Reddit, but Clockwork Knight was originally supposed to be one game, but in order to give the console more content at launch, it was decided to split the game in half with the latter half of the game releasing later. I wanted to verify this with different sources, so I reached out to the most dedicated Clockwork Knight fan I know. Tongara, the admin and creator of clockworknight.com, was critical in getting all the information I needed for this video, and I can't thank them enough for answering my questions. Tongara also has connections to some of the developers of the original game, so I knew their insight would be valid. They state that while it hasn't been confirmed or denied that the story was meant to span over the course of two games, there are a lot of hints that the two were supposed to be part of the same package. This includes certain music, enemies, and sound effects from the second game being hidden in the first, and vice versa. What is known is that roughly six months of development went into the game before a lot of what was designed had to be retooled, and considering that Sega wanted this to be a launch title, only the first half of what was finished got released thus resulting in the Sonic 3 & Knuckles situation we have now. Luckily, the second half had a much healthier development period, so the team didn't feel rushed when completing the game. But as a result of the split, I feel the best way to experience Clockwork Knight in its entirety is to play both games back to back. Luckily, Sega understood this and released both games together in one package titled Clockwork Knight Peporocho no Fukubukuro, exclusively in Japan. So any North American or European fans wouldn't be able to experience the two together without double dipping. This is incredibly unfortunate, but fairly common for the Saturn as a whole. The console was insanely popular in Japan, even outperforming the Nintendo 64 at one point if you could believe that. But overseas, it was a different story. 
It sucks that the definitive way to play both games isn't available to most people. So, because it's the holidays, let's take a quick peek. Yeah, I know I lied about covering two games, but I gotta make up for the lack of a video in November. Shut up. In terms of raw content, Fukubukuro doesn't change a lot in terms of gameplay, but manages to connect the games together in a way that definitely feels more complete. Before you start each stage, you even get bits of dialogue between Pepper and his friends, giving them more purpose than just having them be in the background. But there is some content missing, most notably the credit scene from Clockwork Night 1. Kinda shitty that the people who made the game didn't get any sort of billing in the compilation, huh? Weird quirks aside though, I can say for a fact that this is definitely my favorite way to play Clockwork Night. But, like most Saturn games, this method isn't the most accessible. But for those of you who own a Saturn and would like to experience Fukubukuro, the ROM files are out there if you're looking to emulate it, or potentially bring a backup if you have the means to do so. Clockwork Night, as simple as it is, holds up really well, especially the sequel. Prior to working on the script for this, I hadn't played either game, and getting to experience them for the first time was such a delight. Sega was always trying to find new ways to push their creativity, something that would continue as a tradition with more recent titles like Sonic Unleashed, a game so visually ahead of its time that it took until the wow. Xbox Series X to get it running at full speed. That is some hardcore shit. While there were plans to get future games developed with the Clockwork Night IP, including a game called Night and Night for the GameCube, none of them came to fruition. Given how expensive it is to collect for the Sega Saturn nowadays without having to resort to emulation or burning backups on CDs, I doubt the franchise will see new life anytime soon. But given how good Sega's been at resurrecting their old franchises lately, you never know. We may just be seeing the start of a new renaissance for Sega's lineup of classic characters. Heck, Pepperocho even got a shout out as an unlockable icon for the player profile in Sonic Colors Ultimate, so it's clear that Sega hasn't forgotten about him. If that's the case, then I do hope Pepperocho will make some sort of return, even if it's just a re-release of both games like Fukubukuro. While Clockwork Night 1 and 2 may not be the pinnacle of Sega's best work, I'd make a strong argument that these games represent everything I love about the company. Ambitious, flawed, but above all, fun. You might see it as a mediocre franchise that never went anywhere past the second game. I see it as something more than that. The Saturn was perhaps Sega's most controversial and experimental time in their history, but to me, that just makes it all the more fascinating to learn about. Whenever I want to introduce my friends to the Saturn and its library of underrated classics, I'll always remember Clockwork Night, the little game that became a cult classic and ushered in Sega's jump into the third dimension. But more importantly, I believe it's the game that would forever define the Saturn's appeal, and why the console would remain a fan favorite for years to come. Yes, I promise you this heart is true.